It's our last farm class. Who's excited? Yay. Wait, not until well, you have a whole another semester of farm to go. So it'll be a lot like this class, just different topics. So um, and we're going to change up a little bit. I think we're going to add an additional quiz and change some of the balancing a little bit of some of the stuff. So there'll be some changes. But your feedback is obviously always uh, preferred. And it's good we can get some feedback after the first semester, because then I can change things if we need to going into the second semester, right? But anywho. Um, you guys can finish up your stuff, it's no problem. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah we're going to do it anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, any questions from anything last time we talked about? We're kind of getting into the urology stuff. We're talking about erectile dysfunction. You guys are here for a very excellent lecture on that. <laughs> Have you seen any issues of priapism in the ER or issues of erectile dysfunction, right? What are they normally taking? What are they, they normally take for it? Um, while well, they were coming in, they needed, they wanted more things to get for it, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen them. You haven't seen them? That's okay. All right, well, we'll get into it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you explain, like, when Cephalomar is used for chronic kidney disease? Yeah, so that's going to be for uh, acting as a phosphate binder. So it's good. So say, for instance, you have someone who is hypercalcemic. Because normally, like, what could you use as a phosphate binder? Like calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, right? Like calcium and phosphate love to bind up together, and when you precipitate that out in the GI tract, it can't be absorbed, right? So that's a good phosphate binder. If someone who's already hypercalcemic mm -hmm. due to kidney dysfunction, then that's where something like Zoelomer so is going to be a, a good option there, right? You could use something like aluminum, but again, that can be a problem long term because you worry about the neurotoxicity because they can't really clear it that well, right? Yep. Good question. Thank you. Um, all right, so getting into it. So we're talking about erectile dysfunction. The goals. Of erectile dysfunction, uh, when we're treating this, are going to be basically, obviously, uh, increase the number of, uh, or improvement in the quantity and quality of suitable erections. Um, make sure they have reasonable expectations, right? This isn't just something like, hey, I just need a little extra performance in the bedroom, right? This is going to be for pe people who actually have like issues with it. And one of the things you'll find, is, and I say this only patients with legitimate complaints, like, is this a type of uh, is a group of drugs you can abuse? Absolutely. Like in some places, we actually will manage these erectile dysfunction medications as controlled substances because we're worried about the staff stealing, right? You're worried about people who say, hey, I'm going to take some of the Viagra home, you know, just for fun, right? And so you'll have, like, you know, young men who are able to have erections just fine. They use this as sort of a performance-enhancing sort of drug, right? So anyway, so you want to make sure this is going to be just for people who have a legitimate issue. Um, obviously, you want to make sure that the cost is uh, going to be a thing there. Now, again, when you think about, like, insurance coverage, um, just something like insurance, like, absolutely has to cover. It's not like your life-saving statins or your ACE inhibitor. This is, like, more of a recreational sort of drug, right? So because of that, oftentimes you're going to find that a lot of patients uh, may only be able to get, a, say, a pill or two at a time because they can't be pretty expensive, right? Um, so they'll come in and say, hey, you know, I mean, just, uh, you, have, you can write for 30 if you want, but they may only be able to cover, like, you know, one or two or something like that. You know, just kind of cover them for the weekend. Maybe they'll come back. I had when I, uh, my brief stint in retail farms. I had this one guy who would come up every single Friday, dress to the nines and come in and get his Viagra. You just get one pill at a time. So that's all I need. It's good to go. So um, that's fine, right? So at the end, this is going to be more of a PRN sort of medication. It's not going to be scheduled around the clock. It's only going to be really when they, when they need it. And we'll talk about scheduling of the, of the meds in just a few minutes. Anyway, um, obviously, if we can correct the underlying cause, like, so for instance, if it's a medication causing the problem, maybe look for an alternative, right? Maybe change the dose, maybe change the time, whatever the case may be. Um, there are going to be some non-pharmacologic Options that are going to be here as well. I'm going to talk about these very briefly because it's not really my realm, but there are surgical options here. There are things like prosthetics, there's uh, vacuum devices, things like that. We're going to focus on the meds here because that's what we're interested in. But who do you think might be good candidates for some of these alternative non medication therapies? Hmm? What'd you say? Okay. It's a little, a little rude, but okay. But. Yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about yeah the drug interaction. So like uh, patients with like significant cardiovascular history, maybe the, these drugs are not going to be a good option for them if they just don't want to take medications. Um, there's a lot of like older gentlemen who just say just put in put in a prosthetic. I don't want to have to worry about taking a medication, right? And that way they're just kind of one and done and they don't have to think about it. So um, there are definitely some some use cases for uh, some of these alternative methods. But typically we want something that's going to have a pretty fast onset. 
you want something that's going to be efficacious, obviously convenient. Um, and there's you know this uh, idea of using something that's a little bit more discreet, right? So again, you can pop a pill pretty easily. No one's really going to notice that versus having to bust out like a big vacuum device. It's going to be a little bit more cumbersome, right? So again, depending on the patient, you have a conversation with them, figure out what's going to work best for them. Generally go from least to most invasive. So if you can start off with a medication, that's great. And then if you have to move on to something or prosthetic or some sort of surgical option, that's going to be sort of like your, your last line. Some people may jump to that, but yeah, generally you want to go least invasive first. So um, generally the treatment paradigm here is you're going to find that obviously you try to, you know, remove various factors, get rid of any kind of reversible stuff. Um, you know, if the issue of testosterone, you know, levels being low, replace that if you need to, whatever the case may be. Um, but then phosphodiesterase inhibitors are going to be our first line drugs here, right? So this is where you get your Viagra's and your Levitra's and things like that. So we're going to talk about these. Um, and then if they're working, you know, give them a few doses to see how it's going to work for them. Um, you know, titrate the, the doses you need to, whatever the case may be. If those are ineffective, that's when you're going to move on to other things, right? So either like a, uh, prosthetic or something like that. But phosphodesterase inhibitors are going to be the main thing. We'll talk about one alternative medication as well. It's going to be a prostaglandin. Uh, it's going to be used here uh, additionally. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So anyway, um, so I mentioned the vacuum uh, devices. They're pretty good. Like they're very effective, but you're going to find that um, you know, patients may not really uh, appreciate kind of the, the how cumbersome it is. It just you know, takes uh, you know a while to set up and, and using all that sort of stuff. But it's good for patients who cannot use a, a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. When I write PDE, that's what that's standing for. Is phosphodiesterase. Um, there's different isoenzymes of that. We'll talk about five as being the big one and used for uh, erectile dysfunction. I'll talk about the other ones in a minute, and those are going to be important for side effects. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But um, looking at how the actual phosphodesterase inhibitors are going to be working, um, basically, and again, some people have this misnomer, they think like you just take a Viagra and all of a sudden you have an erection. It's not really the case there, right? It just mainly is facilitating the process of developing that erection, right? We talked about the, um, the patho, not the pathophys, but the physiology of, uh, of erections. This is going to be something where you still need that stimulus, right? You still need that external stimulus to kind of start the process here. But basically, once you have those nerve connection saying, hey, we want to generate an erection, um, you're going to find that nitric oxide is going to be developed here, right? So nitric oxide typically or then goes on to produce what secondary messenger? GMP. Cyclic GMP, right? So cyclic GMP is going to form. That's going to cause what to occur? Vasodilation, right? So good. And this is important for side effects, so keep that in mind, right? So cyclic GMP levels are going to go up, and then it's going to cause vasodilation. Then you have the erection, correct? Right? Because blood flow entering in is going to be higher than what's leaving. Um, well, how do you get rid of cyclic GMP? Phosphodesterase, right? So phosphodesterase is going to break down the cyclic GMP. Well, if I inhibit that process, I have extra CGMP around, and that's going to cause extra vasodilation. That's going to cause the erection to occur. So basically, by having your sildenafils and things like that are going to be coming in here and inhibiting phosphodesterase, CGMP levels are going to be higher, and thus you're going to be able to um, sustain that erection for longer. Okay, so that's basically the, the mechanism here. And again, important for interaction in a few minutes here. Um, so the main ones we have are going to be sildenafil, vardenafil, tadalafil, and then avanafil is the newest one. Um, you're going to find that they will differ a little bit based on their kinetics and things like that. Some of them last a little bit longer than others. Some of them are going to have a little bit different flavor of side effect profile, which we'll get into in a second here. Um, now, again, they're not completely specific for PDE5, and that's where we're going to see the side effects come from. Okay. So looking at this, and again, you don't have to memorize this entire slide here, but the things to take away here, right? So looking at the different phosphodesterases that are going to be affecting, this is important to know, right? Because this is going to directly inform your side effects. So that way you know that things like visual side effects are going to be more prominent with sildenafil. You're going to know that myalgias, myopathies are going to be more important than you see with tadalafil. And we'll get into that in a second here, but you can reference, uh, you know, refer back to this. Um, big thing to note are also going to be the half-lives here, the duration of action. What do you kind of notice about these? To doubt, yeah, most of them are going to be fairly short acting, which is fine, right? Because again, you're looking for to use this around a certain window. To doubt feels kind of nice um, because it has a very long duration of action. You can kind of like take one on Friday and you're kind of covered for most of the weekend. So some people kind of prefer for that uh, that means there. So that is one thing you, you like about to doubt feels the duration of action. However, if you have side effects associated with it, guess what? They're going to last a heck of a lot longer too, right? So you have to kind of take the, the good with the bad there. So um, anyway, when you're looking at these, these are going to be first-line therapy, especially for younger patients. They're not really high-risk cardiovascular patients. Uh, pretty discreet. Just pop a pill and you're done. Um, and so we're going to be selecting our agent based on the side effect profile, the duration of action, you know, cost of treatment. Again, this isn't something where you want to be taking these medications right before the act because, again, you need time for to, the drug to dissolve and to absorb and actually have its uh, duration so or have its action there. So you want to make sure they're taking you know at least an hour or two beforehand, kind of get them uh, absorbed and the drug in the system before they, they need it. 
most patients is going to be pretty effective for them. Um, most oftentimes, if they have a failure, it's usually due to comorbid conditions. So you have like diabetic neuropathies and things like that that could be playing a role here. So um, if they are having an issue with therapeutic failures, it could be due to things like food interactions. So for instance, some of these are going to have better absorption in, with fatty foods and things like that. So that can be useful. Um, you know, make sure they give it a, at least a, an adequate try, not just one dose, but maybe five to eight or so. And then you may try try up on the, on the thing there. Now, again, if you're thinking about your know, normal things people might be doing around sexual intercourse, you know, drinking alcohol can be a big one. And we mentioned that's going to have a negative effect because it can kind of blunt that sort of uh, external stimuli. So again, everything in moderation. That's one important thing to, to note there. Now, um, patients you may want to avoid this in are going to be those with um, things like sickle cell disease, things like multiple myeloma and leukemias. They tend to be at risk for priapism. And what is that? Yeah, so is it a problem? Why? Yeah, so again, you need to make sure you have that good, uh, that blood flow because otherwise you're going to have necrotic tissue. And so that's a urologic emergency, right? So you have to deal with that. Anyone remember how we treated that? Either drain it or what else could you do? Yeah, you could use vasoconstrictors, right? So again, <clears throat> this medication is called vasodilation. What if we constricted those blood vessels? Um, so we can use things like um, uh, phenylephrine is a good one. So you can do intracavernosal phenylephrine, right? So, uh, you know, drain doesn't work, then usually they, they jump to that. Anyway, um, so all those commercials, everyone ever like see those commercials growing up where they'd be like, you know, uh, if you have a you know erection more than four hours, come consult your physician, right? You know, it's not to brag, it's just because it could be a risk for, for privacy, right? <laughs> Anyway, so looking at the other isoenzymes here, so PDE5 is going to be good for causing vasodilation of the blood vessels. This is also why at Nemours, I will give little girls Viagra, right? Because it also works on things like the lungs, right? So again, we have things like pulmonary hypertension. You can cause vasodilation of those vessels in the lungs. That's going to cause better flow through there, and you're going to have better oxygenation of that blood. So that's something you may see that used for. Um, you know, if it's not, uh, usually it has like a different brain name for it. So if you ever see um, Rivatio, um, that's the Sildenafil marketed for pulmonary hypertension. It just has a different indication there. But anyway, PDE6 is going to be important because this is going to be seen frequently uh, affecting the eyes. And so it's found in the rods and the cones of the eye. And so this can actually lead to blurred vision, things like cyanopsia. Anyone know what that means? Yeah, kind of blueing of the vision there, right? And then um, typically we're going to see Sildenafil is going to be the main one here. It's going to cause that. Fardenafil, lesser uh, to a lesser degree, to is the lowest risk, but sildenafil is kind of the one you want to think about. It's causing vision changes, right? Um, PD11 uh, is going to be located in the striated muscle, so a lot of skeletal muscle effects here. You're going to see things like myalgias uh, and myopathies that can develop with this, so again, be careful. If they're complaining of muscle aches, usually it's going to be seen with tadalafil because that one has the most activity on PD11, okay? So again, if you had a test question and said, you know, which one of these, is, I could ask as simple as, you know, which one of these is most likely to cause myalgias, you'd say, well, tadalafil could do that because it affects PD11, but, you know, it could say something like patient comes back complaining, you know, saying, you know, it feels like they ran a marathon, they didn't really do anything this weekend, um, you know, which medication is most likely to cause this, or which one do you want to switch them off of? You know, I could ask it a, different, a few different ways, but things to think about, right? So typically they have about a one to two hour onset. So again, you want to make sure they're not going to be taking it like, you know, a couple minutes beforehand because it's just not going to work that well. And they'll think it's not working when really it is, right? Um, and so sometimes things like food can delay the, the, um, the onset, things like that, because it can kind of slow the absorption there. Uh, I mentioned Tadalfa is the slower onset, but lasts 36 hours, right? So it kind of gets you through most of the week in there. And then these are metabolized by CYP3A4, so you want to be careful if you have other drugs that are going to be inhibitors on board, because they can then increase the, the levels, and then you're going to see increased side effects, which we'll mention in just a moment here. And some of these need to be renally adjusted, so be careful as older patients have renal dysfunction, you want to watch for that. So adverse effects. So um, a lot of times you're going to find that the side effects are mediated through this smooth muscle relaxation, right? It's not just the blood vessels that get affected, but other um, smooth muscle gets affected as well. So you can see things like the GI tract can be affected here. So we're going to see things like dyspepsia develop here. If you imagine that lower esophageal sphincter, that smooth muscle can kind of loosen up a little bit and allow for things like dyspepsia, especially in patients who have GERD already. Um, you can see things like headache do that vasodilation within, uh, within the cerebral vessels. Facial flushing can happen here. So all of that is related back to that smooth muscle relaxation, right? Um, you can see drops in systolic blood pressure. It could be okay for some patients, but it could be dangerous for others, especially if they're on other medications that are going to be lowering their pressure anyway, right? So be careful with that. And you're not really going to see the same sort of like orthostatic hypotension like you might see with some of the meds we'll talk about in a few minutes here, but um, it's something just to note that you will see some drop in their blood pressure there, right? Um, again, use cautiously if you have a high-risk cardiovascular patient or just not at all, right? Especially if it's someone who's like needing nitrates for angina, like this is not going to be a good class of drugs, and we'll mention that in a second. So um, looking at this, you know, photophobia, blurred vision, that kind of loss of blue-green 
uh, determination, like that's going to be that cyanopsy we kind of talked about, generally going to be seen most often with sildenafil, right? Because that one has the most activity for PDE6. You can develop, though, this, this non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Basically, you're going to have this like kind of sudden blindness that can develop. So again, obviously, educate your patients. Hey, if you have any vision changes, stop taking the drug because you don't want this to happen because then they can develop into full-on blindness. It could be irreversible, okay? So you can be very careful with that. Um, other adverse effects, we mentioned the myalgias that can happen here with Tadalafil. That's going to be the biggest one. And then also with Vardenafil, you can see a prolongation of the QTC. That can put you at risk for Torsades, right? And again, it's not going to be every patient takes, you know, Vardenafil is going to develop uh, Torsades. But again, if they have other meds that are prolonged QT, that's where you want to be careful with that, right? So adding on one more drug to the pile may be enough to kind of tip them over the edge there. And then we mentioned priapism is rare, but can occur. So again, it's another thing to educate them on, right? If they have an erection more than four hours, they need to come to the ER, right? Because they're probably going to need to have that thing drained, okay? And you're going to uh, oftentimes see that if you're using kind of multiple erectogenic drugs together. So, again, if they're using some of the alternatives we'll talk about here in a second, together with the, the phosphodesterous inhibitors, that's where you see that increased risk for, for priapism, right? Um, does anyone know? Actually, we'll talk about this next semester. There's actually an anti-depression uh, medication that is notable for causing priapism. Anyone know what it is by any chance? It's a trazodone. We'll talk about that next semester. But if you're here, the drug trazodone, that's kind of notable for causing uh, a priapism. I actually saw a few cases of uh, drug overdose. Patient came to the ER. They're actually fine from the trazodone perspective, but then they developed priapism. We actually had to treat them for that. So actually, the overdose is kind of almost secondary to what they actually really needed. So anyway, um, so drug interactions this is a big thing here, right? Because again, these are recreational drugs. So patients may come in saying, hey, I really want that Viagra, but it may not be appropriate for them. And you kind of, kind of um, be able to educate them on why. Nitrates are the big one, right? So nitrates. What do they do? Cause hypotension, they cause vasodilation. How do they do that? The of yeah, they don't break down. Uh, they don't uh, affect the breakdown of like GMP, but they donate the nitri the nitric oxide, right? The the NO, they're donating that, and so now you have it on the supply side, right? You're adding more nitric oxide into the, the pathway, and then you're also inhibiting the breakdown of cyclic GMP that's going to be synergistic, right? So if you have a patient who's taking any of these uh, erectile dysfunction medications, the phosphodesterase inhibitors, this will be synergistic with the nitrates. You can see some pretty big drops in blood pressure, okay? So for instance, you have angina, and you're having chest pain, you're taking your nitrate for that, you can have a sudden drop in blood pressure that can make them so they're not even perfusing the heart refusing even worse than they were before, right? So you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So again, you know, especially with like EMS and things like that, always ask the question, you know, have you taken anything for, you know, an erection recently? Um, you don't want to say, are you taking a phosphodesterase inhibitor? They're not going to know that, right? But you say, hey, do you take anything for, for an erection, right? Or, you know, erectile dysfunction, they'll, they'll be more likely to know that. Anywho, and then um, typically we like to separate these out at least by 24 hours. Um, for Tadalafil, obviously that's going to be longer because the drug has a longer duration of action. So that kind of makes sense there. And again, how would you manage that? They had developed this hypotension. Someone actually accidentally goofed and gave someone a nitrate when they were taking Viagra. Mm -hmm. Hmm? What, what's Strandellenburg? Yeah. yeah, head down, feet up, right? So again, you're kind of helping to increase blood flow back to the head and then also give them fluids, right? So you want to fill up the tank because those vessels are dilated, so you want to get them filled up with something. Oftentimes, you don't need to use a vasopressor to kind of squeeze them back down. Fluids are generally going to be good enough for the most part. And then if they're on a CYP384 inhibitor, they're not contraindicated from receiving the drugs, but you do want to lower the dose or maybe use like a half dose at first just to kind of see how they're going to tolerate it. Okay. Uh, as an alternative, if you did, uh, could not use a phosphodesterase inhibitor, we also have alprostadil, which is going to be a prostaglandin, basically, right? And prostaglandins typically do what to the blood vessels? Usually cause dilation, right? Just like we were talking about for that afferent arterial, the kidneys, right? They cause vasodilation, which is why you see decreases in kidney function when you give an inside to a patient, right? Who, who needs that? Um, so looking at alprostadil is going to do the same thing, right? Uh, the benefit with this is actually going to be um, acting much more locally. So you see much fewer systemic side effects. So this is not going to be a pill that they're going to take. Um, it's actually going to be intracavernosal injection. So again, maybe not all that tolerable by the patient, especially if they're needle phobic or they don't want to uh, necessarily give this to themselves, but it is an alternative, right? Um, you call this caverject or edector of the, the brain interior. There's also an intraurethral insert, so it's kind of like a suppository, but insert into the urethra, and that can actually have the same action. It'll kind of uh, slowly dissolve and then absorb and then be able to uh, be uh, you know used right there in, in uh, the 
uh, the cavernous areas. So anyway, what this is going to do is instead of uh, stimulating or affecting the breakdown of cyclic GMP, this is going to st stimulate cyclic AMP production, right? So you're going to generate more cyclic AMP, and that's going to help to cause that vasodilation there, okay? Um, because this is not nitric oxide dependent, it's going to be good for patients maybe have an impaired pathway, maybe if they are on nitrates, anything like that, um, or if they failed phosphodesterase inhibitor therapy, this is a good alternative. They can use this. Again, not great from a patient compliance standpoint just because they may not want to inject themselves or use that, uh, the uh, you know, intraurethral suppository, but it is an alternative. So generally pretty effective. Um, and it's, there's some other agents we used to use back in the day, but unfortunately they had a, a lar much larger risk for priapism, so we don't really use this anymore. So alprosidil is kind of the main one you're going to be seeing there. Um, and again, usually pretty short duration of action here you're going to be seeing with this. And again, uh, working very locally, so minimal systemic side effects there. You can see, um, you, you want to be careful, especially with patients injecting themselves. You want to make sure they're using good aseptic technique. You don't want them to get an infection, things like that. It's something to be concerned about. So um, again, if they're not working uh, or patients who oftentimes discontinue, this is usually due to things like, you know, they don't want to inject themselves, uh, in inconvenience, loss of interest, cost of therapy, any, any of these reasons um, generally going to be associated with this. Oftentimes not going to be due to lack of efficacy because it does work pretty well. Anyone know where else we use alprostadil? Actually use it a lot in our, um, just similarly, like I, I use uh, sildenafil for pulmonary hypertension, some of these like cardiac kids, you actually use alprosidil very frequently um, in patients uh, with congenital heart disease, especially like newborns. Uh, if they need to keep the ductus arteriosus open, you can actually give them prostaglandins to, to keep that open, right? So they have that, um, uh, you know, oftentimes you can give them NSAIDs to close the PDA. We can give them alprosidil and, as an alternative to actually keep it open. So if you ever see that in a neonate, that's usually what they're using it for. So just um, a, little, a little bit trivia there. But anyway, so um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, alprosidil is going to have a pretty short duration of action, but good and, and pretty quick onset too, right? Because again, as soon as it gets uh, injected, it's going to be working pretty, pretty effectively there within a few minutes. Um, again, make sure they're using aseptic technique. Do not want to get an infection. Um, and then also we're using pretty short, pretty um, high gauge needles here. And again, when you're looking at needle gauges, bigger usually means smaller, yeah, actual smaller um, uh, size needle there, right? So again, you don't need, uh, you know, an 18 gauge you're injecting down there would be very painful, right? So you don't want to do that. Anywho, um, other effects, you know, uh, you're going to find that typically this will get better with a uh, better injection technique. But you think about these older patients, you know, they may not have a lot of good dexterity. Maybe they don't have a, uh, someone that can kind of help them with that, you know, maybe their partner or a healthcare provider, something like that, um, you know, whoever's there. But uh, other things you might see, uh, you can develop these these plaques. So, again, you want to inject the same area over and over again because eventually it will develop some fibrous tissue there. So you want to be careful of that. And obviously, these local pains are going to be the other big thing you see with that. Okay. Um, and then with the uh, the intraurethral injection, also there's some risk for stricture. They have some difficulty avoiding, so this may not be a good uh, for patients who have you know, things like BPH. It could be worse than that, you know, so it's something to consider. Okay. Now they're also uh, yes. How long does that one take to work, like set in? Is it quicker onset? Than yeah, within a few minutes. Yeah. So for instance, like you know, a Viagra, like you want to take it like an hour or two before. Um, something like a Prostadil, you can inject it, you know, say five ten minutes before, right? And then it'll work, you know, forty five minutes to an hour or so, and then it kind of wears off and you're done. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you know, prosthetics are also there uh, as well as an alternative. Again, if they fail therapy or they're not good candidates for anything else, this is where prosthetics can, can play a role here. Either you can have things like inflatable ones, malleable ones. Uh, I had one of my uh, advisees who's on rotation. He was doing it, working in a urology office, and, like, they were just doing this all day long, just putting in the inflatable ones. Instead, like, a lot of the older guys are like, I don't want to mess with those pills and stuff. Like, just put that in, and then I'm done, right? They don't have to worry about it anymore. So some people will want to jump to this, uh, especially older, and, they, you know, they're on a bunch of medications, uh, drug interactions. They don't have to worry about that. So. Yeah. Oh, interesting. There you go. So you never know what you're going to find in a cadaver, right? We use um, we use the anatomage tables. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. It's like a giant iPad um, where they load up like these um, very high res scans of, of um, uh, these patients, you know, oftentimes like the prisoners who like who died from like lethal injection or something like that. Uh, that one of them has uh, uh, just one testicle, and so we actually had the anatomage person there. We were talking to them, uh, and I was like, "How come this patient only has one testicle?" I was like, is, "Am I just missing something?" Like I'm a pharmacist, so, like I'm not really as good at anatomy as you guys are, but uh, I was like, "I'm pretty sure there's only one of those there." And she's like, "Oh, it's actually he got into a uh, fight in prison, actually got stabbed in the crotch, and then ended up uh, having it taken out." So I was like, "Interesting." So you never know what you'll find on on these cadavers here. Everyone has a story, right? <laughs> Anywho, so that's it for uh, for erectile dysfunction. Now moving on, we're going to talk about benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. 
So again, um, this is pretty common, especially in uh, older gentlemen. You're going to find there's kind of two phases here where the prostate is going to be growing. Um, and you're going to find that there's a lot of different drug therapies that are going to be here. So again, we'll talk about which medications are good based on comorbidities. We'll talk about the side effects, all that good stuff. Now, for some patients, you may not need to do anything. It's what we call this watchful waiting sort of approach here. We're just going to see, kind of monitor how it's going to go over time. Um, but we'll talk about things like alpha-1 antagonists. Anyone remember when we talked about these before? Hypertension, right? We said these are not great drugs for hypertension, but now we're going to find they have a good use here for BPH. Um, we're going to talk about our five alpha reductase inhibitors. Anyone remember what those do? Testosterone. Convert testosterone to DHT, which said DHT is more potent than testosterone, good. And it'll even see if phosphodesterase inhibitors are going to be useful here to some degree, anticholinergics, and then obviously surgery can be used. You can cut the whole thing out uh, if you need to, but again, I want to focus on that. So looking at uh, the prostate here, so again, we have the bladder, we have the prostate kind of surrounding the urethra here. Um, anyone know what the prostate even is good for? What does it do? Yeah, so for the ejaculate, it helps to uh, supply some of the secretions uh, for that. It's also, um, uh, actually has a high zinc content, actually a lot of zinc that gets uh, uptaken by the, the prostate, and actually has some antibacterial properties. Um, another benefit of uh, having a Y chromosome, we get some natural anti-infective properties there, and so again, another reason why we're less likely to have UTIs. So there's very few benefits to having a Y chromosome, I'll tell you, but that's one of the few. So you gotta, you gotta go, yeah, every, every win we can get, right? Um, usually lower IQ associated with that, you know. Anyway. anyway um, trust me, I said some very dumb things in my life. Uh, some of them recorded, most not, but you know. Anyway, um, so looking at the prostate, right, we're gonna see the first growth is usually gonna be seen with puberty. And again, when puberty is happening, what's, uh, what levels are rising typically? Testosterone, okay, that makes sense. We're going to find that testosterone has a pro-growth sort of effect on, on the prostate here. We're going to see that it's going to help to develop that tissue and enlarge it, right? So we're going to, that's why we're going to see that by inhibiting actions of testosterone, you're going to help to shrink down the prostate. It'll be important for treatment in just a few minutes. There's a couple of different, and again, you see that second growth spread around the uh, age of 40 or so, okay? Um, three different types of tissue here is going to be important. We're going to see there's this epithelial tissue. This is what actually kind of is the, the actual machinery of the thing. It's going to produce secretions and whatnot. This is stimulated by androgens. I say androgens, I just mean testosterone, and more importantly, D, uh, DHT, right? So it's going to help to stimulate that tissue and, and grow it. Um, next, you'll have your stromal tissue. This is smooth muscle. It's going to be kind of surrounding that epithelial tissue. And so this is going to be embedded with these alpha-1 receptors. Alpha-1, when it's stimulated, typically does what? It constricts, right? So again, when you think about smooth muscle with alpha-1 receptors, just like in the blood vessels, when you activate them, you're going to cause vasoconstriction, right? This thing, uh, same thing happens here. You're going to cause constriction. And again, when you constrict around that urethra, what happens? You're decreasing that radius. You're going to cause decreased flow, or you can cause impingement, right? So that's the other thing you're going to be seeing here as well, is that not only is it the growth of the organ that we're concerned about, but it's also going to be the actual squeeze of it, right? Because again, if you squeeze on that hose, the flow is going to come out, right? Um, and next, you have this kind of capsule kind of surrounding the whole thing. This also has some andro um, uh, adrenergic receptors as well. So again, make sure not to get confused between androgenic, which is testosterone, and adrenergic, which is going to be things like norepi, uh, epinephrine, right? So you can keep those two separate in your minds. Um, so those are the main kind of type of tissues we're going to focus on. Now, testosterone, as I mentioned, gets converted to DHT via 5-alpha reductase. And so this is also what causes things like acne and hair growth and this kind of masculinization uh, that occurs here. But, and for our purposes here, it causes the prostate to grow, right? So again, if you have a patient that's a very large prostate, you're going to find that testosterone is going to be the main culprit here. And we're going to be targeting our therapies to that, okay? Um, estrogen is also going to be a byproduct of androgen metabolism, right? So testosterone eventually gets converted over into things like um, estrogen. It's mainly going to be through aromatase is the enzyme there. We talked about aromatase, um, or we will talk about that a little bit when we get into uh, ob gyn stuff next semester. We'll talk about it a little bit like with cancer um, because it's an important thing, especially with estrogen-dependent tumors and whatnot, right? Um, and again, that can cause some stromal growth. Less important here, the main thing we're going to focus on is that DHT. So, um, and then when you're looking at the pathophys here, there's uh, what we call either static factors or dynamic factors. Dynamic, you're thinking changing, right? It can, uh, can get better, it can get worse. Static factors are things that are kind of, it's just, that's the way it is, right? Um, it's going to be much slower to change. Usually, static factors are going to be uh, uh, more associated with this prostatic enlargement that's actually physically impinging on the urethra there. So, that's what's obstructing that urinary flow, right? Um, typically, this enlargement is going to be either due to the androgen stimulation, Right, so again, the DHT causing that uh, tissue to grow, or it could be somewhat due to this estrogen stimulation, but it's usually kind of a minor effect compared to the, the DHT. 
the dynamic factors are going to be more, again, changing. It's going to be more related to this alpha uh, one effect, right? So again, if I'm stimulating alpha one, it's going to cause constriction there, and then that can also impede that that flow there, right? Also, it can be triggered under cases of stress, pain, you know, anything where your fight or flight system is getting activated, your sympathetic nervous system is going to activate that, right? Because again, if you think about if you're running away from a bear, do I need to worry about urination? Not typically, right? And again, I want to keep that blood volume up anyway, right? You may pee your pants anyway, but again, it's going to be something that's not really related to the prostate. So looking at this, um, you, you can have symptoms either from dynamic or static factors, or it could be both playing a role at the same time there. And so it's important to um, kind of be able to, to figure that out. You know, do you have like an enlarged prostate? That's going to be more associated with those static factors. If it's a smaller prostate, maybe it's going to be more related to the dynamic. Usually within a large prostate, it's kind of a mixture of the two, though. So we're going to see that our drugs are going to be um, either targeted to one or the other, as we'll see in just a few moments here. Okay. Um, and then typically, you know, we have these more moderate, severe sort of voiding symptoms. This is going to be definitely uh, related to this and kind of increasing in, in the prostate size. So um, medication effects here, things that can worsen BPH, because again, you always want to look for med problems. You know, if you can take a patient off of a medication and fix their BPH, that would be pre uh, preferable, right? So things like testosterone replacement. So if I was giving testosterone to a patient, or maybe they're taking it themselves, maybe recreationally, right? So I mean, you have a bodybuilder who's coming in complaining of voiding symptoms. Maybe something you want to look into. Maybe they're using replacement testosterone. Um, that gets converted to DHT and will increase the size of that prostate, right? Um, so you're kind of increasing the size of the prostate, but you're shrinking the testicle. You see all kinds of different size changes that can occur there. But again, things to think about. Um, adrenergic agonists, things like pseudoephedrine, right? Where do I find pseudoephed? Over the counter, it's something people take all the time, right? Or actually behind the counter, you can get it. Um, but, you know, phenylephrine, ephedrine, any of these things are going to cause vasoconstriction. Thus, it's going to cause impingement on that uh, urethra there. And then also you can see anticholinergics. And so you think about things like antihistamines, uh, which we talked a lot about already. So things like, you know, diphenhydramine, meclizine, et cetera. Uh, phenothiazine is what we're going to talk about next semester when we get into the, um, uh, the behavioral health stuff. That's going to be drugs like your phenergens and whatnot. Um, TCAs. Anyone know what TCA stands for? Yeah, tricyclic antidepressants. We'll talk about that next semester as well. But they all have anticholinergic sort of effects here. And now if you think about um, your uh, your anticholinergic mnemonic, what do we say that was? Yes. Dry, yeah, so my dry says... Remember the dry as a bone? That's the thing we're going to focus on here, right? So again, causing, uh, uh, by blocking those muscarinic receptors, you're going to cause relaxation of the detrusor muscle. You're going to cause more storage in the bladder, but it's also going to inhibit urination as well. Right? So this is one thing to consider there. Usually leading to more like urinary retention sort of an issue. So looking at um, the, the uh, symptoms here. So again, usually with the, the obstructive sort of symptoms, you're going to find it's going to be decreasing the urinary flow rate. Um, can lead to incomplete or slow emptying of the bladder. Obviously, that can lead to things like uh, bladder over distension, can lead to things like infection potentially. So again, these are um, usually, this is what the patient's complaining of those. They so have a hard time, they have poor flow, you know, things like that. Um, you're going to see that. Anyone ever seen that, that SNL commercial where they had this like uh, like a fake BPH med they were, um, uh, they were trying to market and had this one guy with like a garden hose and it was kind of like just kind of spurting out and then he looks over at his neighbor and he has this like huge garden hose just like spraying everywhere. Kind of like that, right? So again, that's usually what they're going to be complaining uh, about. Anyway, so uh, other symptoms they can have here. So these can be irritative symptoms. This is usually going to be with more line of long-standing BPH. It's kind of been developing over years. This is generally due to long-standing bladder neck obstruction here, right? So you can see definitely things like bladder muscle hypertrophy. Like, why would that muscle have hypertrophy? Well, it's going to hypertrophy because it has to squeeze harder to get that, that urine out, right? So again, any muscle you overwork is going to get bigger, right? So you can see, and now what's that going to do to the storage ability for the bladder? Right, just like the ventricles, like you don't want to get them hypertrophy. You think it'd be pumping better, but really gets stiffer and it's not going to be able to hold as much. And so the same thing happens to the bladder. I thought that it would maybe dilate because it has to hold um, so much fluid. Yeah, so you have this distension, but also in order to prevent that distension, the muscle is going to also want to try to squeeze it back in as well. So again, you're going to find that over time, um, that, that hypertrophy is going to limit your, your ability to store urine uh, effectively, right? And again, when you, when you can uh, have that happen, then you know, it can then back up into the kidneys and you can have other, other issues that develop there. But anyway, um, the other thing is that that bladder becomes much more sensitive, right? So again, it's very high, hypersensitive. It's going to be even small amounts of urine are going to stimulate the urge to, to urinate. So it's other things to consider. Um, so have frequency, urgency issues. Uh, I may see things like, you know, bedwetting, may have things like nocturia happening here. And again, think about older patients. They're developing nocturia. It means they're getting up in the middle of the night. What else could happen? They fall, right? It's dark. And then you know, maybe they're on some antihypertensive meds. And they fall, they crack a hip. And then guess what? Not, not good, right? You know? Quality of life goes down pretty significantly after something like that. So our symptoms, um, you know, you're going to find uh, may not always be present, may not always be progressive, but you're going to find that typically, um, you know, uh, 
that a lot of these treatments here, uh, once you take the meds away, especially if you're doing things like affecting testosterone, you take the meds away, what's going to happen? Symptoms are generally going to come right back, right? Because again, as long as the patient's still producing the same amount of testosterone or they still have that same base, uh, that, that smooth muscle constriction via alpha-1, it's going to come right back in a lot of cases there. Um, so again, this is usually going to be more of a lifelong sort of uh, treatment, uh, as you'll see. Um, some patients may improve with no treatment whatsoever, that's fine. You can do that watchful waiting sort of approach, but they're having you know, anything that's affecting their actual urinary symptoms, you may want to, to intervene there, right? And the ultimate thing is we want to try to prevent these um, these lower urinary tract symptoms, those kind of more um, uh, neurogenic sort of uh, effects you can see over time, you want to be careful of, right? UTIs as well, because we know that UTIs uh, can be a frequent cause for old people coming into the hospital. You know, you have an old person developing ultimate mental status, is it an infection, is it something else, dementia, you know, this is something that could be related to that, right? So anyway, so um, other complications you can see with this acute urinary retention that can feed back and cause acute renal failure. You be careful with that. You can see things like hematuria, um, you know, recurrent UTIs, uh, bladder stones, chronic renal failure. All this can develop. You know, some of these are more rare than others, but you can see how these uh, may develop with this kind of long-standing overfilling of the bladder there. So what do we do? Uh, basically, with mild symptoms, you can just kind of you know, just watch the waiting approach is totally fine. Just kind of monitor the patient, uh, see how they're going to develop here. With more moderate uh, symptoms, as we'll see, um, that this is where our drugs are going to come into play here, right? Because ultimately, you could just take the prostate out. That would be fine. It has its own kind of um, side effects associated with it. But in most cases, you're going to find that for more moderate symptoms, drugs are going to be playing a role here. And so based on what their comorbidities are, or based on how large their prostate is or what their PSA levels are, that will dictate what sort of drugs we're going to be using here, right? And PSA, normally with the larger prostate, you're going to be developing more PSA. So so that kind of goes along with that size there, right? Um, so looking at that, we're going to find that you can reference back to this because we're going to talk about these different comorbidities and when we would use one drug versus another, but kind of reference back to this as, as um, when you're studying. So anyway, our outcomes here, we'd like to prevent those lower urinary tract symptoms, you know, prevent disease complications, obviously, and hopefully if we don't need uh, surgery, we can avoid that, which is always good. Um, and then obviously our treatment should be cost-effective, should be well-tolerated. You're going to find that... Um, in most cases, we're going to try to shoot for things that are very uh, specific for treating the prostate. We can't always get away with that. Sometimes we're going to be seeing more systemic sort of effects, and we'll talk about those. Okay. So um, looking at our pharmacologic therapy, we're going to find that we have things that are going to be prostatic smooth muscle relaxers. How do you, is they going to work? How do you relax that smooth muscle? Well, what constricts that smooth muscle? Alpha-1, right? So we're going to have alpha-1 blockers here, right? So we mentioned those uh, as being used for uh, hypertension. Um, remember any big side effects you saw with those drugs? Or the side hypertension was very bad, right? We're going to try to focus on things that are going to be more specific for the prostate, as we'll see in a minute, but those are one way to do it, right? Now, is this going to do anything to the prostate size? No, because alpha-1 didn't actually affect the size of the prostate in the first place. It just affects that squeeze of it on the urethra. Now, we can reduce our testosterone. What do you think that's going to do to the size of the prostate? should reduce it, right? So again, if I'm eliminating that, that uh, stimulation, then you're going to see that size of the prostate is going to go down there. Um, so this is going to be good for helping to reduce those static factors, right? Because again, the whole size of the prostate is going to go down. Um, on the chart, it says um, EPH is small prostate. So is it EPH in the large general? Is that relative? Not necessarily. So... So you see benign prostatic hyperplasia, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that the overall size of it is especially large. It could just be that you're having more of that, that squeeze on there, right? So yeah, so when you see BPH, like it's kind of a misnomer because you kind of think, yeah, you should have a large a large prostate, but it may not be that. You know, it could be you're having too much squeeze on there on the, on the alpha one. So we're kind of lumping that into the this whole category, so to speak. Yeah. Anyway, um, so this is where if we want to reduce that prostate size, this is where our 5-alpha reductase inhibitors are going to be playing a role. It's going to help to decrease that DHT stimulation of the, the prostate there. And then we have some drugs that are going to help to uh, relax the bladder uh, detrusor muscle. And so these are going to be things like uh, antimuscarinics. This is going to help with those uh, irritable voiding symptoms. Now, again, that doesn't really affect the ultimate problem here is they're having impaired flow, but it helps to kind of hold on to more. Um, maybe don't have as much urgency, as much uh, frequency there, right? So again, it's not really going to treat the ultimate disease, but um, it's going to be useful adjuvant sort of medication. So we'll talk about urinary incontinence a little bit later in this slide set, and, and we'll talk a lot about those anticholinergic drugs. Right? Okay, so agent selection should be on a case-by-case -case basis. 
And again, the benefit's only going to be around as long as the patient's taking it, right? So they say, well, my BPH is all fixed. I was taking this 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, and it's good, and they stopped taking it. It's going to come right back, right? Because as soon as they take, uh, they lose that drug effect, that is going to come back, and it's going to start to, to affect the prostate again. Um, generally, alpha-1 antagonists are going to be uh, used as first line because, one, they're going to be pretty rapid acting, and they generally have fewer side effects, right? If I can get away with avoiding, um, you know, things like testosterone levels and DHT levels in the patient, that's going to be good because that's going to cause a lot of side effects, as we'll see in a minute. Um, five alpha reductase inhibitors are going to be preferred for cardiovascular patients. Because we already mentioned that alpha antagonists are going to cause what? Hypotension, right? Something you want to be concerned about. Um, and in some cases, you may need combination therapy, right? So again, if they're having a lot of the static and dynamic factors playing a role here, this is where you can use more than one drug to get some, some additional benefit, right? They're going to work synergistically together. So uh, if they have erectile dysfunction and BPH, this is where you can get away with using a phosphodesterase inhibitor. That could be a good first-line agent. Um, typically, it's less effective, but you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. That could be useful. And again, this may be something where they're taking it, say, more around the clock, right? So they may be taking it more scheduled to treat those, uh, those uh, BPH symptoms, not necessarily just for you know, erectile dysfunction purposes. And again, you may see that a patient, you know, if you write a prescription for that, they take it to the pharmacy and they say, oh, they rejected it. They, wanna, they want you to pick up 30 of these, and the insurance is only going to cover for three of them. What do you do at that point? Sometimes we need things like prior authorizations, right? So that's where you have to actually, um, you know, the pharmacy might call you back and say, hey, you know, uh, the insurance isn't going to cover this. And you say, okay, well, I have to talk to the insurance company now. Let them know that this is what we're using it for, right? Um, and so sometimes when you're making those um, calls, and that's, again, why it's really good to, when you write your prescriptions to put the indication on there, right? So that way, why are they taking it, right? The patient may not always be super aware or be able to, uh, to communicate what they're actually taking or what, why they're taking it. I'll give you a good example. So my cousin um, recently, he's uh, like 37, right? Recently got put into the hospital, right? So he had uh, dizziness, had chest pain. His dad died at 48 of a massive heart attack. So like we were really concerned this is like some cardiac, right? Um, turned out it was just asthma, sinusitis, but he, you know, it only took like one drug before he went into the hospital. He came out, he had like six or seven new prescriptions, antibiotics, steroids, multiple steroids, you know, inhaled, uh, nasal. I mean, so even young patients, and, and I was talking to him about it, and I was like, what they put you on that for? And he's like, I don't know. So sometimes the patients just don't know, and he's, he's a young, smart guy, but he's not medically inclined. So again, that's why it's nice to put indications on there, because that helps other providers know, okay, what are you trying to do here, right? So that's good uh, to include that information. Sometimes it can head off a lot of those phone calls. Anyway, something to think about. Anyway, um, so patients who have most of those irritative symptoms, uh, this is where anticholinergics are going to be useful. So again, if it's more of an issue of like a lot of frequency and urgency, this is where uh, anticholinergics will play a role. And we'll talk a lot about that later on in the um, uh, incontinence section. Um, just be aware that with those antimuscarinics, you said they're going to lead to urinary retention. And that's going to be not good if you have a patient who has a really high post-void residual, because that's just going to worsen that. It's going to cause more distension to occur there. So that's one to consider. So, and do you guys mind if I just go straight through and finish this up? That way we have a little bit of time for... I only have like 30 slides left, and that way you'll have some, some time for review, and maybe we'll even finish up early, potentially. Okay, so you guys are good with that. My Christmas present to you, right? <laughs> Actually, I'm just worried about being towed because all the parking spots, the visitor spots are taken up, and I had to park in the adjunct. I don't know if they know them in adjunct. Or not, so. No, I, I talked to the security guy. He's fine. He's like, what are you parking there for? I was like, I'm an adjunct, I swear. I have a tie on. Um, Listen, if you kind of fake that confidence and you have a tie on, you can get into a lot of places. I'm just saying. <laughs> Anywho, um, so getting into our alpha antagonists. So again, these are going to be alpha-1 adrenergic antagonists, right? So we already know what some of the side effects are going to be associated with these. And mostly hypotension, orthostatic hypotension is a big thing to think about. Now, we talked about there's several different generations. First generation ones are really nonspecific. We didn't like them a lot because you see uh, hypotension. The heart wants to do what to, uh, to compensate for that? Get tachycardic, you see arrhythmia that can develop there, not really used a whole lot, right? Um, second generation agents are going to be uh, a little bit more specific just to the alpha 1 receptors. So they have no alpha 2 antagonism, which we know alpha 2 is going to be more important for things like clonidine and things like that from the sort of a central standpoint. The nice ones we use nowadays are going to be the third gener uh, generation agents. They're going to be uroselective, meaning they affect alpha 1, but more specifically, this alpha 1A receptor. So again, they get even more specific because they, in you thought you knew everything about alpha and beta receptors, but there's even more specific subtypes of receptors. So alpha-1A is what this is actually affecting here, and those are mainly just found on the prostate. Yep. Um, so again, the benefit of that is you're going to be limiting a lot of those more systemic side effects. You see less hypotension seen with that. Now, again, what do we say about selectivity for some of these receptors? It's all relative, right? So again, depending on how sensitive the patient is, the dose they're taking, you can see some bleed over effects. So it doesn't eliminate that hypotension, but it also reduces it pretty significantly. Okay. 
And then uh, just remember, these have no effect on prostate size. These are only going to be helping to affect those dynamic factors, going to help with that, that uh, smooth muscle constriction. The agents we have here, if you remember, we have things like prozosin, terazosin, doxazosin, and then alfazosin is actually one that's uh, more specifically marketed for uh, BPH. You can see that right in the name, uroxetrile. Right, so again, that euro isn't right in there in the names, so kind of conclusion what it's used for. Um, as we mentioned, the first thing you're going to see is are the big side effects you worry about things like first dose syncope. What do you think that means? So there's that first dose they take, and they're not maybe used to that blood pressure blood pressure lowering effects, and they try to stand up and then not realize that they're going to have that orthostatic hypotension, they pass out. Right. Um, not great, right? So this is typically one thing you may want to use maybe at nighttime, right? So maybe if you're giving them to them at night, they're sleeping, uh, they'll kind of get used to the medication, they should be fine by the morning time. Um, but again, dizziness seen with that, syncopal episodes, orthostatic hypotension, those are the big things you want to watch out for. And again, these are going to be synergistic with other blood pressure lowering medications, right? So again, if you have someone who's on an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, et cetera, these are going to be synergistic with that. So that's what you want to be careful of. Generally, start low dose and titrate up. You can always give a little bit more. Titrate over several weeks. And again, dosing at bedtime kind of helps to, to mitigate that, that uh, orthostatic hypotension just by the fact that they're going to be laying down for, you know, several hours instead of trying to get up, right? Um, Typically, you want to um, avoid prozosin. It's pretty short acting, so you have to give it multiple times a day, see most of the cardiovascular effects. Um, however, things like doxazosin, alfazosin, longer uh, half lives, uh, and so they typically are going to be a little bit more used frequently for, for BPH specifically, right? And then alfazosin has kind of the lowest incident of systemic side effects, and again, that's why it's kind of marketed specifically for BPH. So that was probably the one most people would want to go with uh, first line. Now, the third generation ones, these are getting used more frequently because now they're starting to, they're a little bit older, they've been around for a while, and some of them are becoming generics now. Um, but this is where you have things like Tamsulosin or Flomax. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense. So Flomax, um, you know, the name's right there in the name, tells you exactly what it's going to do. Um, so uh, just be aware that you want to avoid these in patients with sulfa allergies. There's some cross-reactivity with that, so just be aware of that. There's also the Cylidocin or Rapaflow. Um, not used too, too often, mainly due to drug interactions, so Tamsulosin gets used most frequently. Um, now, in some cases, you may see a tamsulosin being used in cases of kidney stones. Uh, the reason why people will do that is because sometimes the stones will be lodged in the urethra and can um, uh, providers will use this to kind of try to relax the urethra a little bit to allow a little bit um, easier time passing it. So sometimes you'll see it used for that occasionally. But for the most part, BPH is the main thing you'll see Flomax being used for here. And again, pretty few side effects from a systemic sort of standpoint, maybe some flu-like symptoms, some nasal congestion, uh, and some patients may have this anejaculation that can occur here, so be careful. Um, you just kind of let them know, hey, if you have any changes in you know, uh, your ability to perform you know, in the bedroom, anything like that, uh, that could be related back to the medication. And again, a lot of the antihypertensives are going to do what for a patient's erectile dysfunction? Typically worsens it, right? So again, anytime you're causing that vasodilation across body-wide, you can may, maybe potentially induce erectile dysfunction. So you want to be careful with that uh, for these patients. Anyway, um, as we mentioned, uh, the phosphodesterase inhibitors are going to be synergistic, causing drops in blood pressure. Uh, and so you got to be careful you're using alpha-1 blockers and PD inhibitors together. Um, but you're least likely to see this with a combination of Tadalafil and also with Tamsulosin. So if you mix those two together, they tend to have fewer uh, risk of having that kind of systemic sort of hypotension you're going to see there. Now, going into the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, these are some new drugs we're talking about here. Um, again, these are blocking that conversion of testosterone to DHT. You still have the testosterone around, but we said the testosterone is less potent at the androgenic receptors than DHT is. So we have things like finasteride and dutasteride. And so these are going to be better for large prostates, right? Because these are going to help to take away that DHT effect. They're going to shrink down only while the patient's taking the drug, though, right? And so you can see here uh, things like finasteride decreasing DHT levels by 80 to 90% in the prostate. Very effective. However, you also see pretty big drops in the serum as well. So what do you think it's going to do? What kind of side effects might you expect to see? Hmm? Sort of these kind of feminizing sort of effects are, right? So you may see things like gynecomastia. You may see things like um, abnormal hair growth, you know, things like that. You don't necessarily see atrophy in the testes. So um, you would see that if I was giving, say, a testosterone replacement because that's actually causing the test, because again, uh, um, the test is where testosterone is produced, right? So if it's sensing that, hey, I have enough testosterone around, they're going to cut down production, right? That negative feedback loop. With this, though, you're actually inhibiting that conversion over. So if anything, you may actually cause a little bit of extra stimulation there. You say, oh, we don't have enough DHT. Let's produce some more. Um, so you don't necessarily see uh, atrophy from that standpoint. But again, it's important to kind of work through that mechanism and see why. Well, how come with testosterone replacement you see it, but not with this drug that's dropping testosterone levels, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, and actually you have to be really careful. These, um, uh, what do you think this might do, say, to a developing fetus? 
not great, right? You never want to mess with uh, hormones in a developing fetus, right? Just like we don't want to mess around with like cholesterol drugs. We mentioned like a lot of those, um, you know, like the statins are not good for pregnant women. Um, these are also not great, right? And actually, uh, a lot of times they recommend like not even, uh, you know, women of childbearing potential not even handling these drugs unless they're wearing gloves and things like that because you worry about having some some contamination there, right? Um, so oftentimes these get uh, managed what we call hazardous medications. So like chemo drugs, um, anything can cause, you know, changes, um, you know, in, in uh, you know, white blood cell production, things like that. Um, kind of get lumped in this hazardous uh, sort of category. They wouldn't be taking it, but I'm just saying even if you're handling it, right? So, for instance, if you had, like, uh, a nurse who was going to be giving these medications, you want to make sure they're actually wearing gloves because, you know, what if they're pregnant? They can actually have some effect there, and they're really kind of cautious with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so you have to think about the healthcare providers, too, is being potential, uh, having potential exposure to the medications. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but yeah, either of these uh, work pretty well. Again, better for enlarged prostates, right? So um, looking at these, these are going to be good for patients who maybe cannot tolerate alpha-1 antagonists. Um, and, but they can be used in combination, right? Because this isn't really going to have any big effects on blood pressure. So you could use this with an alpha-1 blocker. So you can use uh, Flomax along with finasteride. It's not really going to be any uh, big issue there. But you should see some big drops in, in, their, in the size of the prostate. Now, um, what do you think about the, the onset? How long do you think it, this would take to kick in? It takes, a, it takes a little while, right? So, it's, again, it's going to be uh, a while to kind of decrease because, again, you're dealing with the actual tissue size itself. So, it needs time for it to start to go back down in, in size there. So, again, this is not going to be quick onset like you would see with an alpha-1 blocker. Um, so, but just be aware of that. And, again, they need to take it consistently. Otherwise, the prostate size is going to uh, be right back up as soon as the drug is gone. Um, but uh, you will see higher incidence of sexual side effects, and that's mainly due to the fact that you're decreasing those DHT levels, right? So, again, if you have a young guy uh, sexually active, it may not be a good drug for them, right? Or, say, you imagine, like, you know, a 40-year-old uh, guy that's coming in with BPH symptoms may not be the best drug for them. So, again, these are going to be good for long-term uh, use, but the sexual dysfunction is a big reason why a lot of people will try to get off of it uh, in, in most cases there. And, again, pregnancy category X, meaning do not have this anywhere near pregnant lady because it is going to be teratogenic. Right? It's going to cause negative effects on those fetuses there. The other things you're going to see, like decreased libido, that's mainly due to the DHT effects of going down, uh, gynecomastia. So, again, a lot of that kind of feminizing sort of effects is due to dropping the uh, DHT levels. You still have testosterone, but testosterone really isn't as nearly as potent as, as DHT will be. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, phosphodesterase inhibitors can also be used for BPH, uh, but good in patients who also have erectile dysfunction as a, a comorbidity there. Um, in some cases, you may see they have a little bit of a counteractive sort of effect with the alpha-1 antagonists and the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, um, but we just know that uh, in some cases, uh, patients, it may be a useful kind of add-on sort of drug there. Tadalafil is probably the most studied, and it kind of makes sense because Tadalafil, what was kind of unique about that drug? Long as half-life. All right, so we're going to have the longest duration of action. It's not going to have, you know, it's going to be more likely to work throughout the day. So that's why we use that most frequently. Okay, so I mentioned anticholinergic drugs can be used uh, to help with the irritative symptoms, again, because those symptoms are kind of mimicking an overactive bladder. So, again, this is going to help to relax the detrusor muscle, allow for better storage there. Um, and, again, typically you want to start with low doses, titrate up, um, and be careful if you have patients who already have a lot of uh, big post-void residual because, again, you're just going to worsen that. So be careful on that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes when we get into the urinary incontinence section. And then obviously, there's surgical intervention. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but usually it's going to be uh, when patients have failed drug therapy or if they're not good candidates for drug therapy, surgery can be a good um, option for those patients there, right? Okay, any questions on that? 21 slides left, and you're done with Pharmacology 1. Isn't that wonderful? You have Pharm 2. Don't worry, I'll come right back. Well, unless your evaluations are really, really bad, then maybe they won't, won't have me back. But I'm just kidding. They can't get rid of me at this point. <laughs> anyway, so um, getting into urinary incontinence. So, again, now we're kind of uh, getting out of just the male centric sort of uh, uh, urology stuff, but this is going to be kind of an equal player here. Um, so, again, looking at urinary incontinence is going to include involuntary leakage of urine, it's going to occur uh, urgency. Um, you know, usually find these patients have a lot of uh, either daytime frequency, nocturia associated with this. And also, like, there can be some, some pretty negative effects from a psyche sort of standpoint, right? So, again, if you're worried about, you know, um, going to the gym because you have, you know, some of this uh, urinary incontinence associated with that, or you sneeze and you have a little bit of leakage, like uh, those are things that, that can really kind of affect people, right? So uh, one thing to kind of consider. So looking at our pathophys here, so what are some of the reasons why we can have urinary incontinence? Well, there's several different factors here, and again, we're going to find drugs can be playing a role here as well, but you're going to find um, that basically you guys are familiar with the anatomy of the lower urinary tract, right? So I'm not going to belabor that point, but remember that the the trusor muscle is going to be innervated with what sort of receptors? 
A lot of parasympathetic receptors, but specifically what type? Muscarinic, nicotinic? Muscarinic. A lot of it's muscarinic, right? So again, think parasympathetic nervous system, think muscarinic receptors there. So you're going to find those muscarinic receptors are there. However, there are going to be some adrenergic receptors as well, right? Because typically um, we mentioned alpha-1 does what? Causes constriction, right? So again, think about that fight or flight response. I don't need to pee if I'm being chased by a bear. So you're going to cause constriction on the on the urethra. It's going to cause a relaxation of the bladder muscle. However, um, if you have, say, muscarinic activation of the bladder, so you're just going to stimulate those muscarinic receptors, what does that do to the detrusor muscle? It causes it to contract, right? You normally think about, uh, you know, muscarinic receptors maybe causing dilation, causing relaxation. This is the case here where it actually causes constriction, right? So it's, it sounds kind of counterintuitive uh, in this case here, but that makes sense, right? Because again, if I'm trying to go to the bathroom, I'm going to try to squeeze down on that on that detrusor muscle, okay? Um, don't worry about if it's M2 or M3. Just know there's different types of muscarinic receptors, but um, they, they're going to work pretty similarly for our purposes here. Okay, acetylcholine is the main uh, neurotransmitter. So uh, the urethral sphincter is going to be playing a big role here. Obviously, if you loosen that, you're going to be leaking out urine, right? So we don't want uh, to uh, – and there's going to be an internal one and an external one. Internal one, is that under voluntary control? No, right? It's involuntary control. Uh, the external one, under voluntary control, right? So even though I may have the urge to go to the bathroom, I can say, well, I'm going to finish out this lecture, and then I'll go, right? <laughs> Whatever the case may be. Um, again, just by talking about this stuff, you're going to have to go to the bathroom all of a sudden, right? Because I sort of think about it. Um, so that's one thing to consider, right? So again, you can affect the urethral sphincter. We have the bladder as well. This should be able to relax and accommodate uh, whatever volume of urine you have there. It's actually kind of fun. We were doing um, some training for ultrasound, uh, and we're, we're checking our bladder size and seeing who could hold it the longest and get the biggest size bladder. It's kind of fun. Um, like medical people have weird, weird games they play. But anyway. Um, I won, by the way, but um, <laughs> just kidding. But again, that compliance uh, is going to be mediated through that smooth muscle relaxation, right? So again, if you have something like acetylcholine causing uh, activation of muscarinic receptors, it's going to cause squeeze, and that's going to lead to less um, uh, less ability to kind of hold that urine there, right? Um, and again, think about things like you know the the neuro sort of uh, stimulation there that's going to be affecting that, right? So if you have patients with spinal cord injury, you may find they're not able to to hold their urine well, right? Because again, if you're disrupting that, you're going to have that in, uh, internal sphincter potentially not really uh, uh, being communicated with very effectively. You may have a, you know, uh, altered parasympathetic activation there. So anyway, so a couple of different types of urinary incontinence we'll talk about. One's called stress urinary incontinence. Any urinary incontinence can cause stress, but this is specifically stress urinary incontinence we're talking about here. Um, basically, this is going to be incontinence seen with like a burst of activity. So for instance, if you're exercising or if you sneeze or cough or anything like that, um, basically this is going to be due to sort of inadequate urethral closure forces, right? So again, the uh, urethral sphincter is not closing tight enough, and so you're having some leakage uh, occur due to that. Typically, it's pretty low volume. Kind of once it happens, once that stress is gone, then it kind of closes back down again. Uh, typically pretty episodic, okay? Now, who might be at risk for this? Post-pregnant women react. So again, like after you pass a baby, like a lot of things change, and that's one of the things you can see that stretching of the urethra there, uh, and so that can be a, a big thing. A lot of women may complain about uh, menopausal women. Uh, you can see it's more in obesity, aging, just naturally occurs here as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, is menopause happen because of uh, decrease in estrogen? Yeah, so estrogen is actually going to have some positive sort of um, kind of pro-growth effects uh, around there, and so if you decrease that effect, you may see some of that um, start to atrophy a, a bit. So yeah. Potentially, yeah, and we'll talk about that when we get the OB-GYN section uh, next semester, but that is a potential uh, therapy there. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's a good segue for several months from now, right? <laughs> you guys really like those, those segues. Anyway, um, now again, typically this is uh, stress urinary incontinence is going to be pretty rare in uh, male patients, but it could be caused by surgery. Um, you see this sometimes in patients who uh, have a prostatectomy. Sometimes you can sometimes see this as a uh, sequelae of that. And this can be aggravated by drugs, right? So if you imagine something like an alpha antagonist, we just said alpha antagonists do what to the urinary tract? Typically cause relaxation, right? So again, if I was on an alpha blocker, potentially this could cause worse in urinary, uh, stress urinary incontinence because, again, you have less closure force there. Um, what about ACE inhibitors? Cause you cough, right? So again, if you have cough associated with that, maybe switching over to something like an ARB might be better for those patients, right? So again, little things you might not even think about uh, could be uh, playing a role here. So um, next up, we have urge urinary incontinence. And so this is usually due to bladder overactivity, right? So stress is usually due to uh, urethral underactivity. Urge urinary incontinence is going to be due to bladder overactivity, right? So again, this is typically going to be associated um, with urgency, that desire to avoid. Uh, and usually it's going to be due to detrusor overactivity, 
due to some of these involuntary sort of contractions here, right? So maybe you have too much stimulation of those acetylcholine receptors uh, causing that uh, squeeze on the detrusor muscle. Not the same as overactive bladder. This is going to be more urgency than the necessary frequency here, right? Um, typically, it's idiopathic. Um, in some cases, you may have more of a ner uh, nergenic sort of, uh, you know, uh, now, origin to this, um, uh, or you can see things like you know, bladder outlet obstruction can be playing a role here. Um, but this is something that could be worsened by things like diuretics, could be worsened by alcohol. Why, why, why would alcohol worsen um, urge urinary incontinence, do you think? So it causes you to go, you need to go to the bathroom, but why? Yeah, decrease in ADH, right? So antidiuretic hormone actually goes down when you drink alcohol. That's why when you break the seal, you have to go to the bathroom a bunch of times. Same thing, right? So this can worsen that by causing kind of uh, a decrease in ADH. ADH does, why does that affect? You're in production. How does it do that? Aquaporin channels are right, in the collecting duct. Remember, that's what was uh, stimulating. So you're reabsorbing less water, so more of it's getting produced, right? So I think through all these different mechanisms here. Um, I can't say there's a study out there saying that. Yeah. I do know what you're talking about, right? So it just, it's probably one of those things where it's just like, you know, after that first time, you're like, you're kind of more sensitive to. That bladder sensation of like, hey, I've you know, got this increased volume here. I need to go to the bathroom again. Who can say, right? You should run the study, though, if you want, right? So you can you have to you do a grad project. So give all the first years a bunch of alcohol and then see when they need to go to the bathroom, right? That could work. Not for my 8 a.m. classes. It might, everyone would be asleep anyway, so. Anywho, um, right, so urge is going to be due to bladder overactivity. Stress is going to be due to urethral underactivity, right? Uh, and they have this overflow incontinence. And so this can be a combination of the both, right? It could be one or the other or a combination of the two. This is generally going to be leakage due to uh, the bladder um, being filled. And it's kind of unable to empty itself. So you have this kind of chronic retention that occurs here. And then when you have this urethral hyperactivity, usually seen with BPH, you're kind of squeezing, so you can't really get rid of it uh, in these cases here, right? So bladder is kind of filling up too much. You may have an impingement. It's preventing it from uh, uh, being uh, leaving. Sometimes you can see it's in certain neurologic diseases as well. Um, it, uh, things like spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. Um, and then there could be a, a factor of bladder underactivity here, right? So again, it's not squeezing enough to kind of get full, um, uh, you know, full emptying going on there. And this is usually due to things like diabetes, right? Because that can happen due to those neuropathies that develop there, um, long-term bladder outlet obstruction, et cetera, right? So again, all of these can be playing a role in this kind of overflow your urinary incontinence. I only belabor these points because, again, it's going to be important when we're talking about the different drug therapies, which ones are going to kind of, some are going to be good for one type, some are going to be better for another type, okay? Um, you know, in the overflow, sometimes you can have drugs that are causing this to occur. Usually, these are going to be due to anti-muscarinics, right? So things like tricyclic antidepressants are a big one, which we'll talk about next semester. Alpha agonists can be another one as well. How, how would that cause overflow incontinence? Uh, yeah, so you have smooth muscle constriction around the urethra, so that, again, impinges on, on that outflow, right? So, again, if you're taking Sudafed, that can maybe worsen this overflow incontinence, something to think about. Um, and then things that may decrease that bladder uh, contractility, mainly anticholinergics, you know, calcium channel blockers can do this as well. This can bleed over and causing uh, effects on that smooth muscle there. Antipsychotics uh, do it frequently, so some of these we'll talk about next semester. So anyway, so uh, how they present is going to depend on the pathophysiology. As we mentioned, you know, with the, the urethral underactivity is generally going to be seen with physical exertion. So again, ask them, you know, when do the symptoms occur? What kind of volumes are we talking about? Um, that's going to be uh, kind of giving you clues to kind of what's going on. Uh, bladder overactivity. Usually going to be seen with uh, high frequency, so you know, several times a day. If they're going, you know, waking up some multiple times in the middle of the night, and things like that. And then uh, with overflow incontinence, this is usually really going to kind of feel that abdominal fullness or kind of this uh, hesitancy. May not be able to have a complete uh, voiding uh, volume there. And again, may have frequency and urgency together. Okay. So um, the course of therapy obviously is going to depend on what's kind of bothersome to the patient, right? So is it due to the volume of urine there, the frequency? Um, sometimes you can get away with using non-pharmacologic therapy, like if it's just every once in a while, every time they sneeze, maybe they have uh, some, some uh, you know, incontinence, maybe something like an absorptive pad is it's good enough, right? You don't necessarily always have to jump to a medication, but uh, depending on how frequent it is, how bothersome it is, this is where drugs come into play. So our goals here, obviously we'd like to restore continence for these patients. We'd like to reduce the number of episodes and try to prevent any complications, right? So again, if this is the thing that was maybe pushing a patient over the edge needing sit of care, like, you know, around the clock, you know, maybe you can keep them out of the nursing home for a little bit longer, right? Because what happens to patients when they go to the nursing home? It's not good, right? Typically things go downhill because they are risk for infection, you know, they're not seeing their loved ones, you know, uh, dementia can work. I mean, all kinds of bad things can happen there. And you usually see the sickest patients coming from the nursing home, right? So as we see the, the most nasty infections and, you know, resistant bugs and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, Anyway, so that's the biggest thing. And then obviously, you know, improved quality of life is going to be uh, the most uh, important thing, but by minimizing the side effects, minimizing costs, et cetera.
So generally, um, we want to use medications for patients who are going to be obviously not controlled with just non-farm uh, therapy there. Usually we like to use combination therapy, right? So for instance, you know, non-farm stuff can include like maybe not drinking a bunch of water before you go to bed, right? Maybe that can help to, to prevent that. Maybe not consuming alcohol, um, you know, things like that. It can be non-farm uh, approaches, but then drug can uh, can be added on top of that and have some synergy there. Um, usually drugs are going to be selected based on the type of your uh, incontinence they're having there, and so we'll talk about that. And then also consider what comorbidities are playing a role here as well. So non-farm stuff, as we mentioned, better from more mild to moderate symptoms or you know, kind of infrequent is going to be um, preferred there. So things like, you know, toilet scheduling regimens, um, you can have pelvic floor rehabilitations, like doing your kegels and things like that um, is going to be more uh, preferred, you know, infrequent symptoms, more mild symptoms. So uh, for urge urinary incontinence, anticholinergics are going to be our first line drugs, right? So it's going to be anti-muscarinic drugs. And so you already know the side effects are going to cause. What side effects are going to cause? Dries a bone, mad as a hatter, red as a beat, hot as a match, anything else? Blind as a bat, right? Yeah, so again, you have all those things. So kind of think about that. What does it do to the heart rate? And it causes tachycardia, right? So again, think about those, those mnemonics, right? It's going to save you in a pinch when you're trying to think about what the side effects are of some of these medications here. But the anticholinergics we have include things like oxybutynin. And tolteridine, these are two of, the, two of the more common ones you're going to run into. You have things like uh, trospium, solafenacin, darafenacin, and uh, fesoteridine. Okay, so those are the main anticholinergics you're going to run into. And notice this is one of those things where a couple of them came out and they're like, oh, these are really good for your urinary incontinence. And then you have a bunch of kind of Me Too drugs that come on board as well. They're all doing the same thing, though. They're in, uh, blocking the muscarinic receptors and uh, helping the bladder to hold on to more volume, right? It's going to relax that detrusor muscle so that we hold on to more stuff there. Now, would this be good for a patient with, like, say, overflow urinary incontinence? No, because their volumes are too high to begin with, right? So, again, think about the pathophysiology. Think about what drugs are going to be appropriate for those patients. Here, your, our urge urinary incontinence, we want to be able to hold on to more of that volume there, and hopefully, you know, uh, we'll talk about things that can help with the urethral closure as well. But these are all considered equally effective. Most of the... Uh, what will kind of lead you to picking one or the other could be things like you know insurance coverage could be things like half-life drug interactions and we'll talk about those in a minute so a lot of them are going to have different dosage forms available some of them will be immediate release some of them are going to come as like long-acting formulations obviously what's better for um for compliance long-acting if i give less frequently it's always going to be preferred right some of them have transdermal options that are available who's that good for you think hmm um, could be if they have issues like maybe swallowing, they can't take anything orally, or if they have like maybe memory issues and they just put a patch on them and they don't have to think about it for a few days. Um, those can be things that can be useful, right? So kind of think about uh, what doses for may be appropriate for your patient there. We talked about the anticholinergic mnemonics. So you already know what those side effects are. So think about, you know, if you have a patient with like kind of worsening dementia coming into the ER, they're, like, they're just not acting like themselves. Ask about new medications. A lot of times these anticholinergics can be playing a role here. Because we talked about that man as a hatter. This can oftentimes be uh, one of those things that can really worsen that. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I've mentioned the beers list before. We'll talk about that next semester. But anyone know what the beers list is? Have I mentioned it before? It's not like what you get at the restaurant. No, I don't yeah, it's, it's a list of drugs that are like really bad for old, uh, old uh, older patients, right? So typically they're going to cause a lot of altered mental status, you know, things orthostatic hypotension, things like that. A lot of these end up on the on that beers list, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about Jerry uh, uh, next semester. But just know there's going to be certain meds that are just bad for older patients. These, these tend to be some of them, right? But again, it's always a double-edged sword, right? You just have to consider, you know, what's going to be um, most appropriate. Is the incontinence such an issue that they're considering going to the nursing home? Maybe it's okay to have a, act a little wacky, right? Um, not really. But, you know, think about titrating your dose. Think about making sure um, you're kind of, um, you know, kind of monitoring for those side effects. Let them know what to expect. Anyway, um, you know, falls can be another uh, thing as well just due to that, you know, that, um, change in mental status. You know, you can see that. So just be aware of falls. Elderly patients, you want to be careful with these. And again, if they're already having urinary retention, you don't want to uh, exacerbate that anymore by giving these drugs. Be careful with that. What is this going to do to a GI motility? Slow it down, right? So if they have already long-standing constipation, probably not good to add this on board uh, as well, right? Um, things like glaucoma, you want to be careful with that. And then myasthenia graphs would be another case where uh, you want to avoid these. I'm not going to get too much into that, but it has a lot to do with the, the muscarinic receptors um, not being affected there. 
Anyway, so um, looking at urgent, uh, urge urinary incontinence, we mentioned anticholinergics are going to be first line. Extended release preparations are great from a compliance standpoint. Um, however, um, you're going to find this helps to mitigate some of the side effects as well. Instead of having multiple doses a day where you get these really high peaks and then they go back down, having little acting formulations help to kind of have a little bit more of a sort of nice plateau throughout the day and mitigate some of the side effects. And again, we mentioned dry as a bone. So again, dry mouth is a very common uh, side effect you see with a lot of these and it can be kind of bothersome to the patient, right? Um, Oxybutynin does have some risk for orthostatic hypotension. That's mainly due to the fact that it has a little bit of uh, alpha blockade there, but that could be good for what type of patient? They have BPH, right? Or maybe they have hypertension. But um, so again, think about oxybutynin. Uh, it's kind of a unique sort of thing with that one. Um, and again, with a lot of these XL formulations, you do not want to crush or chew them. You have to be careful with that, right? So again, some of them they may want to try to break it in half, take half a dose. You got to be careful with those because if you break that formulation, all of a sudden, all the drugs don't come out at one time, so you kind of shoot yourself in the foot from that standpoint. Okay, so um, you can always look up, you know, do not crush or chew list, and that's important to be able to uh, you know, educate your patient not to uh, alter those. Uh, Tolteridine uh, is should be avoided in patients who have uh, poor kidney function. So again, creatinine clearance less than ten. That's you know. Pretty much a dialysis patient at that point. Um, and then be careful of patients on a CYP3A4 inhibitor because this will increase the levels there, so you may want to drop your dose for those patients. Um, Trospium is another one that's used. It's a, more of a second generation anticholinergic. This one may be better for older patients mainly because it's a quaternary ammonium. You know what that means? It's kind of really smart if you say quaternary ammonium. Basically, it means it's a nitrogen that has four bonds to it. And when you have four bonds to it, it gives it a permanent positive charge. We said positive charges don't like to cross what? They don't like to cross the blood-brain barrier. So this is good because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It means you're not going to have less of those CNS side effects. You still have things like the dry mouth. You still have the you know issues of um, tachycardia, all the different things. But uh, you may not see the uh, same CNS sort of side effect, which is good. Okay, um, poor, Pretty poor bioavailability. So you want to make sure they're taking it on an empty stomach. So again, all these things uh, with these older patients are on you know, 12, 15 medications. Like timing of the meds can be really important. It can be really difficult depending on what they're taking there. Um, something else you could try. Uh, we have things like Botox. Why in the heck would you use Botox? Hmm? To relax it. It's going to cause what? Paralysis, basically, right? So just like we use it on the face for aesthetic purposes to kind of relax those muscles, um, it's basically causing paralysis, right? It's actually one of the most potent, actually the most potent toxin in the world, right? Just a few milligrams of that could kill hundreds and thousands of people, right? So again, it's a very, very potent toxin, so why not inject into our faces, right? Yeah, it works. Um, but we can use this for a lot of different things, like you know, especially that like increased spasticity. We use this a lot, like in, in our uh, cerebral palsy patients who have a lot of spasticity. We'll use this. Um, we can also use this in the bladder, right? So basically, Botox, coming from Clostridium botulinum, is going to be able to uh, be injected into that smooth muscle and actually causes uh, prevents release of acetylcholine. And so by preventing that release of acetylcholine, there's nothing to affect those muscarinic receptors there. So what do you think is maybe some of the benefits of using something like Botox versus, say, an oral anticholinergic? Yeah, you limit those systemic side effects working uh, directly in there in the bladder. You don't have to worry about that. However, what's some of the drawbacks of it? It's pretty invasive, yeah. I mean, it's a surgical procedure to have this done, right? So, again, you're going to have the patient go under anesthesia. It does work for a while, but they may need repeated administrations, right? Um, so it's one of those things where it can be, um, uh, you know, it work every, you know, for four to eight months or so. But symptoms will come back over time. They may need reapplication of the drug. and it can be uh, somewhat expensive there. So just be aware of that. Um, and, of course, once the drug is there... You can't take it back, right? So that's kind of the other thing. So if they're having things like, you know, uh, dysuria, UTIs uh, can be present here, um, urinary retention um, pretty frequently, right? So again, you want to be careful with that. All right. Um, for urethral underactivity, thank you for that segue earlier for just a few slides, actually. We talked about estrogens here. Um, this is going to be good for postmenopausal women um, uh, that uh, have that estrogen depletion. This is going to help to kind of help the, that proliferation of that urethral tissue there, right? So you can uh, apply that. Um, usually, you like to use like a lot, a lot of uh, local therapies because it helps to limit some of the systemic side effects there if you can. Um, and so we can use some of the transdermal estrogens. Um, you know, there are obviously oral options that are available. There, we'll talk about all those next semester, so don't worry about that. Um, Typically, progestins have an antagonistic effect. So again, oftentimes with these uh, ladies, you may uh, just have like a local estrogen effect, but progestin may kind of limit the, the efficacy of that. So it's one thing to consider there. Um, and then for most women, they typically will use a transdermal formulation that tends to have the most evidence uh, behind its use there. So it can be useful for those patients. Um, other things, uh, as far as with the urethral underactivity, um, having an alpha receptor agonist could be potentially used here. Um, however, we don't like to use that because, again, if we're causing alpha constriction, where is that also squeezing down on? Where, what else is that squeezing on? 
the blood vessels, right? So again, we worried about uh, causing things like stroke. We used to use a lot of alpha agonists for things like weight loss and whatnot, you know, but it caused a lot of stroke, a lot of heart attacks, so we don't like to use those anymore. So we kind of uh, removed phenylpropanolamine, if you ever see PPA, that's what that's referring to. We don't really use that anymore. But uh, something like duloxetine or some Balta, this is actually a drug we're going to talk about in uh, the, the psych section next semester. Um, we'll talk a lot about antidepressant meds, but um, anyone know what SNRI means? Selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, right? So instead of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, it's an SNRI, a SNRI, some people call it. But basically, it blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine. By blocking reuptake of norepinephrine into the vessels, that mean, or into the uh, into the nerves, you're going to have more norepinephrine around. Norepinephrine then will cause activation of alpha-1 receptors, right? So again, you're basically causing a sort of indirect sort of increase in alpha effect by blocking the reuptake of, of norepinephrine into those uh, into those nerves, right? It uh, can be used. Uh, there's actually uh, a proof for that. It's used off-label here, but it's proof for over in Europe, so there's some evidence for use here. And it helps to just increase that urethral tone, helping with that, uh, that, that low closure force there. That's right? so one thing you can consider. And then uh, for the overflow and cons, we kind of can go back and talk about the, the BPH stuff. We already talked about that there. Obviously, you know, if it's due to BPH, you know, treat that, right? Um, use things like, you know, anticholinergics, um, or I'm sorry, not uh, for the overflow, but use things like, you know, alpha blocker, if it's more of an impingement sort of issue, things like that, right? So, um, so that is the last slide. Any questions I can answer before I go check out the sticky board? Nothing at all? All right.